दिस इज भारत एफ एम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत दिस इज भारत एफ एम गुड मॉर्निंग सिंसिनेटी एंड गुड इवनिंग टू पीपल इन इंडिया एंड वेलकम टू आवर प्रोग्राम रूबरू ऑन भारत एफ एम्स प्रोग्राम रूबरू एंड टूडे द पर्सन होम वी आर गोइंग टू नो अबाउट द जर्नी ऑफ द पर्सन होम वी आर गोइंग टू नो अबाउट इज डॉक्टर कनिक्स कनिकेश्वरन नाउ बिफोर वी स्टार्ट वेलकम डॉक्टर कनिक्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल थैंक यू आशीष yeah and before we start the journey uh, let me uh, read out a, a brief bio about dr kanix dr kanix is an internationally known music composer music educator and scholar he is known primarily for his pioneering innovative work in creating a new sound that of indian ragas in a symphonic choral setting and for his persistence this work has been going on for more than 25 years and it all started in cincinnati in 1994 and it is now known all over the world kanix has personally created and nurtured choirs in over 12 cities in the us his work also spread to europe he was presented with the distinguished alumnus award from iit madras the ohio heritage fellowship and many other awards he has collaborated with many well known musicians and dancers last year his brand new production murasu was cheered by more than 5000 people in the audience at the world tamil conference in chicago he recently produced a stage production remotely in chennai india he presents his music research in conferences in india he has been teaching music since 1994 and he shares his knowledge with all those that he works with He has worked closely with more than 2500 singers, musicians and dancers in the last 25 years. There is more to share especially about what he has in store for the future in the post pandemic era. All right uh So uh, Dr Kanix before we uh, start uh, knowing about your journey tell us a little bit that I might have missed uh, during the your introduction. Uh Ashish first of all thank you very much for having me here and it's it's so nice to be on Bharat FM I still remember the conversations that were uh, in place before this uh, channel came into being now it's a matter of pride we have something of our own here in Cincinnati which is local and yet at the same time it's global and I'm sh- sure it is going to grow to unprecedented heights I and I hope it hope it does and i i'm sure it will because there's so much of uh, uh, goodwill and enthusiasm from people participating not only from here but also from around the world so everything has small beginnings right so i'm hoping that uh, what uh, the, the initiative that started here will grow into something uh, spectacular so that is the first thing i wanted to share second is um, yeah we are in uh, yeah this is an unprecedented year 2020 in the middle of the um, covid season or whatever you, whatever you want to call it and then um, so there's a lot to think about and reflect about in terms of what music was like what it's going to be like and there's a tremendous amount of gratitude on my part and on um, the, uh, you know on how we have been able to express some ideas and actually help the idea grow and also take a lot of people along with it so i'm looking forward to sharing all that but prior to that i just want to share a little video clip and sure. some, of, some of the listeners may have already have may already have uh, seen it um, they were many of them were part of it so it's a grand finale from uh, it's actually the curtain call from the production shanti a journey of peace which is performed here in uh, cincinnati the aronoff center uh, um, in 2014 so let me figure out how to share the screen and do it right now Yeah if you if you have the youtube on uh, then it that if that should be the only screen that you should get to share correct cool can you see now yes i can cool you can go full screen if you want i'll do that so the audio is not clear at all oh
do you want me to send the link on the on the chat and let me try playing it because i sure yeah. why don't we do let's that? let's try that so so re- stop sharing your screen and just send me that link on our this chat on the zoom chat and i will just click it okay i'll do that and then i can share it as well yeah sorry about that um yeah uh, so for whatever reason the uh, volume was not there so let yeah. me let me click on that link now that's a lesson learned okay <laughs> yeah. yeah things happen so just a second before i start that let me share the screen mm-hmm. uh here you go share all right can you see my screen i can see your screen yes excellent and now let me know if you can hear it right as well mm-hmm. yeah i can hear it that was awesome dr kanex uh, so before we move on can you uh, share uh, with our viewers and our listeners what this was all about yeah um this was the concluding part the the curtain call at uh, a performance of shanti a journey of peace which is a a uh, large scale musical production that i wrote back in 2003 and 2004 it's about an one and a half hours long so it wow. is it's a spectacular production which tells the story of indian culture uh, it spans 5000 years of indian cultural history going back to the roots of how uh, uh, a lot of ideas came into being um and uh, i wrote it uh, with the idea of uh, i mean the dream i had was we needed to have uh, a huge choir of indian singers and a huge choir of western singers along with a huge symphony orchestra with dancers and with multimedia telling the story in a powerful way and that dream actually became a reality in 2004 and 10 years later we performed it at the aronoff uh, center and you you might have recognized a lot lot of faces in the uh, singers everybody in this performance was from our community here in cincinnati so this is like a 10th year celebration of the uh first performance of uh, cincinnati and this was at the aronoff center and we had what like 100 plus singers from our community and plus about 50 uh, singers from western uh, choruses here in cincinnati plus a string orchestra and winds and so on and so forth i mean it was huge and even when i wa- watch it the thought that strikes me is would it ever be possible to do something like this again in the post pandemic world but that's a later conversation we can right so uh, so dr kanex uh, tell us uh, up about a little bit a little bit about how you got interested in music and at what point you decided that you need to get serious about this and do something which makes you happy and which you are passionate about at what point did that happen and a little bit of journey before you got to that point sure um so i um i was uh, interested in music right from childhood 
and I used to watch my uh, family members learn music. And I used to learn um, virtually, literally. When I heard them practicing, I automatically uh, registered those exercises in my mind. And I, pretty soon I discovered that anything I heard, I could translate into sur in my head, swaras in my head. So when I, I must, must have been a little boy, eight years old or something like that during that time, nine maybe. Uh, then that was like, after that, you know, any tune you hear, whether it's a Western tune or an Indian tune, that's only the sargam that registers in your head. So that is how I got introduced to it. Then I started learning when I was probably nine years old, 10 maybe, and then um, learned through my school days and get my first concert when I was in ninth grade and all that. And then later on the IIT days, um, um, it was a lot of fun um, being part of ensembles and leading ensembles and participating in inter-hostel competitions and inter-IIT competitions and so on and so forth. Um, then it's after coming here that I got interested in uh, formal ensemble music. See, I happened to listen to concerts here at uh, CCM. I went to grad school here after finishing my B.Tech at IIT in Madras. I came here for a master's in material science and I used to attend concerts here at CCM and other places. And one thing that blew me away was, uh, see, Indian music is all about individual self-expression, right? Um, mm -hmm. You have an ustad, you have, you have a pandit, you have who have spent their life learning music, and they sit on stage and they mesmerize you with their virtuosity and their improvisatory skills. And I mean, they are just able to make up stuff on the spot and sing, and the whole audience of two thousand people just is enchanted for a couple of hours. But in Western music, the whole approach is different. You have a group of a hundred people on stage; they are actually reproducing faithfully something that somebody wrote maybe two or three hundred years ago in a, on a on a piece of paper. So, which is what we call, refer to as a score. And there's a conductor that is holding a little stick and keeping all these people together. What is going on? So, you know, what is the difference between traditions? I mean, it's, it's so different. You go to um, um, Pandit Ravi Shankar's concert or, or Bismillah Khan's concert or um, Ustad Bismillah uh, Khan's concert or uh, something like that. And then here you come and see uh, Beethoven's Ninth being performed with 200 people on stage. Both of them have this have a similar aesthetic aesthetic sense. They have a very distinct impact on impact on the audiences, but the approach is totally totally different. So the thought that entered my head was, what would it take if we were able to combine the magic of our ragas with the discipline of ensemble music here? So that led me to start learning how to um, do these things. And since I taught myself uh, sequencing and programming in electronic music and so on, and it started creating works which would just do the same, uh, like do multi-part music with Indian ragas. And then a friend of mine said, hey, Kanik, to choir shuru kare yaar. Then I said, what? And then, I said, okay, why don't I get a group of people to sing? And in 1994, we got like 20 people, all my friends on campus. Most of them had not undergone training in music. And then we worked for about four months. We would meet every night after din dinner, just learn the music and uh, uh, people put in a lot of work and we all put in a lot of work and it was like uh, sleepless nights and stuff like that. But, you know, there was something that bound the group together. We all had the same objective. We all wanted to learn. We all wanted to excel and we all wanted to show that we could. So almost like a Lagan kind of a spirit, you know, the movie Lagan, but there's no competition here. You don't have to win against anyone. You just have to excel yourself. So that is what is going on. And that taught so many useful lessons going um, into the future. So it was like the teamwork was just unbelievable. And when you're standing on stage, singing in a group of 20 people or something, um, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about uh, anything else. But it's only about that moment. It's just that kshan, that's that second, that instant, that moment when you're just giving your all into making the program a success. So this program was uh, called Basant, uh, aptly so because it was performed in spring and it's, uh, it represents growth, right? Like that was the first concert basically. Then one thing led to another and uh, that is how the whole musical journey um, started in so, core music using ragas. Yeah. Right. So so what was the name of the concert again you said? Uh, Basant. Basant. And yeah. we, Basant okay. with, the, with a B. Oh, Basant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So ragas, which which year was this? 1994. 1994. So yeah. for for being able to do something like this at a large scale that you did, mm -hmm. you need like minded people to come together and help you out. You need basically a team to do oh, this. Yeah, absolutely. 
So how did you gather that team? How did you approach them? How did they get interested in this whole thing? It was nice. We were living on campus. I was living on campus during the time, and most of the singers were from campus. And uh, uh, somehow the energy gelled. We were all friends. We were all buddies. And uh, um, you know that vision was uh, there. So, so I don't. I don't know how to explain it. There was um, one of my friends had started a theater group, and he had done a play on campus in '92, and that also that brought a lot of people together and that uh, the energy that started in 1992 this friend's name is Virin Sethi so he's the one that led the play he's back in India now um, and he's the one who said hey why, why did you start a choir and that's how all this came into being that is amazing you're, because... right, you're right it's the first time and we didn't have whatsapp right <laughs> we didn't have facebook we didn't even have email to come for general email. We used to use email for uh, uh, work related and st- academic uh, work related stuff, but not for personal communication. Okay. So everything was through phone, phone calls and voicemail left on voicemail machines, if you remember those. Oh, yes, yes, I do remember <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so Dr. Kanix, after your first show, after this you did in 1994, mm. What was the feedback that you received and what came into your mind to move on and get to the next step? What happened after that? See, the m- most important feedback was people were moved to tears. That's one. The other thing was they'd seen nothing like this before. And uh, we needed to, this needed to continue. So in 1996, I, I shared this work with a Western choir conductor. Her name is Kathy Roma. She is a very powerful person in uh, terms of getting people together and making things happen musically and otherwise. So she saw this video and she was like, uh, how did you do it? She's, her main amazement was, hey, these are people who are not looking at a music score and yet they're singing complicated stuff and they're singing it together and they're getting it right. How is it even possible? So she said, hey, maybe we should work together. That way we can exchange culture and notes and all this. I said, sure, why not? So we debated on what to present and then we figured out that the most, see, in order for something to succeed, you have to have a theme that appeals to everyone. So if you're bringing together for the first time uh, uh, an Indian group and for the um, a group of Indian singers of Indian origin, along with people who have never heard Indian music before, um, what is it can be what is it that can be the uniting factor? So this is the year 96, 95, 96, and the environment was a big thing during that time. Um, it was a big conversation during those, those days, especially being in the Clifton area and on campus and things like that. So I proposed a concert called the Blue Jewel. The Blue Jewel is the picture of the earth as viewed from space. Yeah. Wow. So the, it's completely about the environment, it's about environmental consciousness and uh, all that. And the theme immediately appealed. Uh, so we started working together. And uh, so, and that program was, was also a wild success because nobody had seen any kind of a collaboration like this before. And it was like there were no celebrities involved. And yet we had three full houses, um, about uh, 550 people in Kresge Auditorium two times, and then a third concert at St. John's Unitarian Church for three with 300 people. Wow. How so, so long was that? Yeah. So, so again, one and a half hours. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really commendable to be able to do that for 90 minutes. <laughs> ah, and this was in 1996, mind you. And again, all the publicity was through word of mouth and through uh, posters. We if Volunteers used to go around putting posters everywhere in Clifton. And again, the, the university liked it very much and they supported it. And then they invited us to come and perform it again in 97. And uh, later on, a smaller version of this in Claremont, Claremont College in Claremont County. So this has actually gone to rural, uh, literally uh, uh, beyond the Clifton confines of uh, where it started. So that's when it occurred to us that, hey, maybe there is more to be explored and we should not stop doing this. And that is how, so this was one of the steps in the growth. And uh, yeah. Right, so uh, so moving on, uh, Dr. Kanix, uh, you did some uh, shows in Europe as well. Uh, how did that happen? How, and you did that remotely, I believe? Uh, yeah, that was much later. Um, that was in 2013 and, and 14. So so between Big Jewel and Shanti, was there something else in the middle? Yeah, lots of things in the middle. So in 2000, the year 2000, we did something for 
or what's called the Millennial Peace Celebration at Xavier University. Oh, okay. And, uh, it was so that's when we started exploring chants for peace. For Basan, it was basically a celebration of spring. For the Blue Jewel, it was environmental awareness, and again using a combination of Sanskrit and uh, also a collage of languages, words that meant earth and space from around the world and so on and so forth. But for the first time, we did a work completely in Sanskrit, uh, celebrating the idea of, uh, you know, this was for um, the year 2000, they inaugurated the Peace Bell and all that. And at the Sinta Center, they had a conference of uh, Nobel uh, Peace Laureates and we were invited to sing along with a lot of our other choirs in the city. So that's the first time we did Shanti Mantra and a few pieces like that. And then after 9-11 in 2001, um, Kathy Roma, my friend from the Blue Jewel and I got together to see, her thought was, hey, you need to do a uh, new production about world peace and we should collaborate on it and we need to get the community together. We need to bring about ideas of no otherness and uh, oneness and so on and so forth. So that's what set me thinking. And at the same time, I had this dream of uh, sharing Indian culture and the, the message of inclusiveness and peace and oneness and interconnectedness and all that with this big stage and what I told you in the beginning, a couple of hundred people on stage and all that. So the two ideas concurred. And that's how I created the production Shanti in 2004. Again, that was an unprecedented success and we performed it a few times. Um, but in 2008 was the, was the very first time, um, sorry, 2006 was the first time we started taking work out of the Cincinnati area. Okay. Yeah, we there was a production called, uh, yeah, the Shanti. I was invited by my classmate from IIT, Raju, um, in the in the uh, Lehigh Valley area. So he just asked me to come over and say, hey, Kanik, just come and talk about music because we um, uh, enjoyed our discussions for a one day, two days when you visited us so much. I'd like to just have this happen in front of a community and see what comes out. And I said, okay, I'll cut it again. But then, you know, any times it's so, kabhi karenge, nothing, it never happens. So, <laughs> yeah. he, so there are some people who make things happen and he's one of them. So what he did was he just booked my tickets and said, hey, you're coming this weekend. <laughs> so then I had no choice. So I just went. And that time, you know, Delta used to fly direct flights from here to Allentown. Uh, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> because because Cincinnati was one of the hub, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a com air, com air flight. And there were like three or four direct flights every day. So... Uh, no difficult, not difficult at all. So I went there and then just talked about music, just like we're chatting, and then ragas and uh, how film music is based based on ragas and what are the roots of Indian music and all that kind of stuff. And people got so interested, they said, "Okay, why don't you come again? Can you come and come again?" I said, "Sure, why not?" So somebody else got the ticket. No, they are in the ticket the next time. We went again, third time, and then they said, "Watched a video of Shanti from Cincinnati, and they, they were blown away by it." And they said, "How can we make it happen here?" Can you guys come? I said, we can't come, but maybe you can sing. So that really opened, all of us started thinking, hey, can we even try something like this? And then, yes, about 50 people in Allentown, it's a small place, got together, we started singing the music of Shanti, and then word spread, and they started invite, people started driving in two hours, three hours, some even four hours from surrounding areas to come and participate in her to start participating in rehearsals. I used to go every month or something like that. And each time I went, it was like a big uh, 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 family wedding kind of a thing because there'll be huge, huge buffet people preparing food and taking care of chai and bisque parleji you know? <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And you know, the thing about Shanti was the mixture of languages, you know? Um, we were a small community in, community in Cincinnati and when we started singing the music of Shanti, it was like, uh, people speaking uh, 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 Hindi, Tamil, uh, Punjabi, Malayalam, um, Assamese, and Bengali, Marathi, Gujarati, and everything. And the same profile repeated itself in the Lehigh Valley. So that was um, something. It was, it was a unique experience for all of us. But yet, when we were on stage, we were all united in that one message of just being together. You know? And then uh, that led to a few other concerts and the feasibility of such concerts happening in other places. So I got invited by Tampa, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and a few other places to create the experience. And a huge Shanti concert happened in Houston in 2010. 
by which time I also got an invitation to go to Singapore and create a musical production there and working along with the National University of Singapore uh, ensemble, Indian ensemble, uh, 2010. And then in 2013, um, I got a call out of the blue, um, actually an email and then that was followed by a call. This was by somebody from the Corzo Dance Theater in the Netherlands. And he said, we heard about your Shanti, can you make it happen here? Hmm. I said, how big is your community? They said, the Indian community is not very big, but uh, we can still see what is feasible. So, so we talked through it and figured out, okay, we'll make another production called Sharad, uh, which is autumn. So remember, we started with Basant, and <laughs> now we were in Sharad. And uh, which, so they pulled together a choir. This is very, very interesting. This is a group of uh, um, in, uh, people like us, the Indian dias diaspora, except they had moved from India much longer before us. They were uh, people that actually went to the, who went to the Caribbean in uh, about 200 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the, the British took them for a lot of historical uh, uh, reasons and they worked there. They went there as indentured laborers and then laborers and then settled down there. And then uh, went up um, Suriname, uh, exchanged hands between the British and the Dutch and so on. And finally, in 1975, a lot of people of Surinamese Indian origin migrated to Holland. And that is the uh, bulk of the Indian population there in the Netherlands. So a group of these people were invited to sing after some auditions and all that. And they, were, they had never sung in choir before and they had never sung this kind of music before, with the exception of one or two people who were engaged in Bharatanatyam who had actually started taking some music lessons and all that. So if I may interrupt you for a moment, uh, yeah. Dr. Kenix, uh, one question I had is uh, like whenever you are doing a choir with such a large number of people, mm -hmm. not everybody can be at the par as far as the singing quality is concerned, right? Uh, so how do you manage that? How do you uh, make people sing who are interested in singing, but not, might not be at the level that you would actually want them to be? How do you train them? How do you get together that fact? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, very insightful question. And it's probably at the root of community choir singing ever since the idea of community choir singing started both in the Western world and the Indian world. First of all, we, the work we have done, uh, there are different types of choirs, professional choirs of people who have attained a level of proficiency and uh, who would be um, really solo singers by themselves. And when they get together and sing, it's uh, really, really of a, of a different level altogether. With the community choir, it's like an open uh, invitation. With the, with the, uh, we do have an audition process. Um, oh. Yeah, but um, in the beginning, it, it was like, if somebody was interested and had the basic ability to sing, um, everybody was welcome. That's, that's how you start. Um, of course, when we did Basant, most of the people had, um, uh, um, you know, that, the, the, the level of involvement, the level of uh, musical uh, training was different from um, the later groups that we worked with. Um, but then you, you're right, there's always a mixture. There are people that have been trained who are capable soloists, and there are people that have not sung before. And there are, uh, I personally believe that what is 70%, 80% of humanity can sing in some way, shape, or form. Nice. I, I, if I didn't believe in that, I couldn't be doing this kind Correct. of work. Correct. That and is. Uh, it, it's, it's in different levels. Okay, Everybody doesn't sing at the same level. But again, here's how I look at it. When I play cricket, I get bored in the first ball. <laughs> so, um, so I I openly admit I can't do that. But if you really want me to play, I'll come and play. So, right. right. So nobody call, nobody calls me. But you know, yeah. So sing, singing is the same thing. Um, right. mm -hmm. So the strong, the people who are good, um, who are good singers, um, typically form function as a pillar which supports the rest of the choir. Awesome. That is that is a very good explanation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanix. Now, before we continue with your journey, one thing just came to my mind, and I'll keep it very short, that every time you decide on a theme, uh, is it the theme that comes first and then you compose everything around it? Or you have something and then you are trying to look for a theme accordingly? Um, chicken and the egg. <laughs> okay, all right. I got the answer then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, now, now we can continue with your journey. 
Yeah. So um, there's always a group of people giving, loving people who don't mind sharing the talent. And then they are, you know, so much of joy is brought about in ensemble singing, in community singing. Okay. At the end of every show, there's so much of hugging, people breaking into tears at the end of a program where you work together for like six months. And uh, it wouldn't be possible if the strong singers in the choir did not support everyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is how, uh, that is how choirs work uh, fundamentally. And occasionally you do, often you would have, um, say a choir is not just, it's not group singing. It's not like, uh, it's not Kirtan singing where you're free to sing anything you want because it's only the Bhakti Bhav that matters when you're in a huge congregation of lakhs of people mesmerized by what is going on on stage or something like that. Right. Um, like uh, when you're traveling to Pandarpur and you're singing on the way, it is different. You don't need to audition for it, right? Right, um, right. Whereas if you are singing in a choir, there are multiple parts. So there's uh, are the high ranges, there's the middle ranges, there's uh, high for the men, low for the men, and all that. There's different ranges, and it's a combination of all these ranges that produces a combined sound. Right. So we need to have strong singers in every every range we are talking about, or even if we limit the ranges to three, uh, you need to have strong singers in all all three. Um, otherwise, it'll be difficult to pull a piece uh, together. I agree, I agree, I agree. So uh, when did uh, like I was looking at your bio data, and uh, one thing that uh, caught my eye was uh, IIT Madras Distinguished Alumnus Award. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I was award, awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, last year um, by IIT Madras. I graduated from there in 1984 and this was uh, um, uh, given to me for uh, the work that I've done in uh, the field of music for the uh, work in choir music and for building communities around uh, music. And there was a big uh, occasion um, last year. And this year was uh, the 35th year of our graduation. And uh, 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 IADM requested me to recreate one of my um, uh, productions back in Chennai. And, um, and how do you do it? There's a 10, 10 and a half hour time difference, but then we, we recruited a choir in Madras in Chennai from sing with singers from IIT and from elsewhere, and we rehearsed everything on Skype and other means, even wow. even before COVID. Wow! <laughs> yeah, so it was a combination of separate Zoom sessions plus also sessions where people got together, and then I called on um, Skype or whatever, and then we pulled the whole thing through in the last uh, three days, and we had engaged dancers in Chennai. It was a spectacular success. It was on the first of this year. That it wow. So, so you were an expert on these uh, streaming platforms already before COVID-19. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had right from the Netherlands days, we had started uh, doing this kind of work. Because when you're rehearsing with people in the Netherlands, there's no other way, right? right? Like the, there's this uh, fantastic group of human beings that are getting together to sing. They're waiting for you to come online. And the only way to communicate with them is by technology because I couldn't, there's no way I could go there many times. So it, looking back at it, I don't know how we pulled it off. It's, I went for one intense session, we rehearsed, and then after that we met uh, regularly on internet and uh, rehearsed the music. And, uh, and the first performance was a success, spectacular success in 2013. So they said, can you come back and do it again next year? So we had one of the best orchestras in the country um, in, in The Hague, and then we had one of well, uh, one of the best known Western choirs sing with us. It's called the Dario Four Choir. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing during those rehearsals was they all spoke Dutch, um, but they could read the music score, right? So the so when they sing, so it's like, doesn't doesn't matter if you speak Dutch or anything. It's only the notation which conveys the music to you. And uh, yeah. let me play uh, a piece from that. Uh, sure, send me the I'll link. Send you, and, I'll yeah. send you the link. Uh, yeah, we, we'll do it the same way that we did the earlier one. Yeah, yeah. So let me get it in just a second. Yeah, as they say, music has its own language. So 
absolutely. Yeah, it's not a cliched statement, but it is. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just sent oh. you the link. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, I have the link. Yeah, you could probably play the last, last. Uh, maybe start at the beginning, but then play the last three minutes or something. Okay, you you let me know when I need to forward, and then I will do that accordingly. Okay. Yeah. You can see my screen. Yeah, I can. Okay. Do you want me to move further? Yeah, I maybe to the yeah that place is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Probably stop now. Yeah. Yeah. So just. Uh, see. Do you want me to play this or just stop sharing? Uh, we can stop. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. As okay. You can see this was a huge, uh, huge success and uh, huge audience and huge. I mean, the, uh, there's an applause that they would just never stop. Right. Uh, and um, on stage, you saw the lead dancer there. His name is Revanta Sarabai. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he is the son of Malika Sarabai. Uh, so I was uh, going to come to that actually. I, I was going uh, to ask you about your interactions with this uh, all uh, so-called famous personalities or the celebrities that you have had. So what was your experience? Yeah, I had I had worked with uh, three generations of the Sarabai family. And, uh, uh, had the fortune of interacting with Rinaldi Sarabai. Wow. Um, yeah, and... Uh, this was in the 90s. I went to Ahmedabad to work with them. And then, of course, with uh, Malika Sarabai and her son, who was uh, very young at that time. And then uh, later on, in, when he was working in Corzo in, in uh, the Netherlands, that's when he um, pulled this production together and he was a lead uh, in this. And um, it was a fantastic experience interacting with him both there and in the US on multiple occasions. And, um, also worked with uh, the Gundecha brothers, um, 
the Revanta Sarabai, whom I just mentioned, was was here in uh, Cincinnati as well. And uh, um, the Gundesha brothers, they also, um, together we collaborated on a project called Guru Guha Dhruva Pada. So that was based on my research where I looked in, into the similarities between uh, the creations of a composer by name, Muthuswami Dikshita. And, um, the, and the Dhrupad musical form. So the so between uh, um, so so Dhrupad um, is an older form of Hindustani classical music, and uh, Carnatic music, of course, is played in South India. So Muthuswami Dikshit was a composer who lived in Banaras, who who lived in South India, but spent five years of his life in Banaras. And uh, there is um, um, so I got looked into the similarities between his compositions and the Dhrupad tradition, and wanted to bring some of the compositions alive in the voices of Dhrupad singers. Oh, okay. So I went to Bhopal and uh, uh, talked to the Kundecha brothers. And even prior to that, I talked to the Guru uh, Ustad uh, Fariduddin Dagar and all that. So, I mean, this was like a research that really, really called to, my, um, called to me. So I made time whenever I went to India to go meet people such as these and to uh, find as many common links as possible. And then in a concert called Guru Guha Dhruva Pada, we together explored the compositions of Dikshitar in the Dhrupad style. And uh, of course, my interactions with uh, Lakshmi Shankarji are um, just, um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't have any words to describe them. You learn quite a lot, even when you just speak with somebody like that for mm -hmm. a few minutes. Mm -hmm. so she has worked with uh, uh, very closely with Pandit Ravi Shankar and uh, their ensembles, and she has done phenomenal work and I actually was able to learn from her and she invited her to come to Cincinnati and sing in Shanti and which she did during a premiere and that was uh, one of the most unforgettable experiences. That is amazing. So Dr. Koenigs, tell us a little bit about uh, your philosophy of music and the local singers out here and uh, also a little bit about the documentary film that you have made. So all those if you can combine together in your discussion. Sure. See, first of all, I I think we already talked that music is uh, um, a good chunk of humanity can sing. It's all, all, it all depends on the structure that is created for them to express themselves musically. So whistling, singing, even dancing are very natural forms of expressing yourself, the joy that is contained in you. Um, so even if it's a simple, even if it's a very serious prayer, um, uh, doing during a dhyan, uh, doing a manan on it or uh, or a sankirtan on it actually um, multiplies the effect of the power of the thought that you're carrying in your mind. So, and uh, it's a way to connect and it's a way to build community more than anything else. And it's not a way, not a means to compete. It's not like um, A is better than B or B is better than C or this era is better than that era or anything like that. There's so much value um, to be to be attained just in expressing yourself uh, musically okay and uh, when you listen to music there's a lot to uh, look for mm -hmm. whether it's bollywood music or whether it's classical music or whether it's anything um just look at um, what um, um so for instance if you're just listening if you're listening to a song it is not just uh, the lyrics of the song or even the, uh, the quality of the voice or the expression of the singer or anything like that. It's more than that. It's how the tune has been thought out and how it was created to fit into a certain situation. Like, you know, for instance, if you're like listening to songs in the movie Anuradha, mm -hmm. uh, whose music was tuned by Pandit Ravish. I'm sure you've heard them, right? Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the actress is uh, Leela Naidu, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the songs, the songs are sung by Lata, Mang Lata Mangeshkar. And it's, it's brought up the best in all the participating artists in that uh, film. And each line tells you a certain story. Yes. And, it um, so it's a, it's a, or pick an old classic like Oh Sajana, mm -hmm. by, again, sung by Lata Mangeshkar and the tune by Salil Chaudhary. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, it's, uh, so when you listen to it, it's not just the voice, but the percussion playing in there, the, the layers and layers of orchestration that you listen and listen to in modern music, but also the simplicity of orchestration that you had, had in older films. So 
every song that you listen to is an intense educative experience plus ideas of what the, the meaning of the lyrics and everything that it's, mm-hmm. it's trying to cover so listening itself is an art so you need to um, it helps if you learn how to listen to music yeah. and then there's a whole thing about music appreciation it's like indian music is based on ragas and talas right mm-hmm. Ra- raga is a musical mode it's a it's a it's a musical melodic musical soundscape it's not just a scale it is not just a collection of notes or anything like that there's a lot to be learned about what a raga conveys to me it's almost like a it is it is an experience it's like something you get into and get out like for instance if i'm listening to rag shri i enter a completely different space and when i snap out of it i'm in a different space okay so i'm kind of exaggerating what i'm what i'm saying but that's uh, the power that some of the ragas have so if you learn what you are learn about what you're listening to it makes a huge difference right about compositional forms and this uh, whole new arena in western music about orchestration the instruments the ranges of sounds and how all these concepts have been incorporated into bollywood movies mm-hmm. over the years and all that so i do um offer um courses on music appreciation and the like and uh, i'll send out an announcement that when we do something like this next time and now that we everybody's tuned to online listening we can definitely um, yeah. make use of the online facility and actually reach out to a large large group yeah that will be awesome that will be awesome so uh, dr kanix a little bit about your documentary film that you have oh, what, yeah. what is that yeah, about bringing back yeah, yeah. see um my uh, the, the one of the composers that is uh, um really touched my um whose work has really touched uh, uh, and influenced the way that i look at music is a composer by name muthu swami dikshit so dik or if you want to just perceive of him as a dikshit um he lived more than 200 years ago he was born and raised in south india but he spent 5 years of his life in banaras mm. now one thing about his life which is unique is that um, when he listened to western music it looks like he did because he spent part of his life near madras and the Brit- british were just making inroads a lot of interesting things were happening during that time you see the year was like uh, the late 1700s it was one year after um when uh, uh um uh, after uh, chatrapati shivaji had come to the very same area okay mm. oh okay. yeah so it's it's amazing how these things are all connected um how there's a big community of marathi speaking people in the tanjavur area and all that so a lot of connections so he he lived in the 1700s when the british east india company was making a lot of inroads um during that time um he listened to tunes uh from the uk um being played by the bands of the west the east india company the result um, uh and uh, when he heard them the way he reacted to the music was he wrote ly- lyrics in sanskrit to many of the tunes that he heard mm. it is very kind of very unusual nobody does these things right right <laughs> and not just one tune or two, two tunes there were like uh, 39 compositions that he came up with so the result is a genre of music which is neither completely indian nor completely western mm-hmm. very unique they right. easy to learn and uh, let me just why don't i just instead of talking more about it let me just send you a quick video link that you can oh, play sure. when i explain the documentary uh, definitely definitely um okay okay let me share my screen you can see my screen uh yeah. i think the oh, okay i think it is going on on your computer as well if you can turn that off oh great okay yeah i will hey just go to youtube and turn that off 
All right. Okay. So let me play this now. Hold on. let me stop the share okay yeah that was amazing uh, so so this is just like a introductory piece of the documentary oh uh, no this is just one of the tunes featured oh, in it okay. so this is like there were like 30 39 tunes and this is actually a french tune which oh, wow. came out during that time and uh, so the story is fascinating how did a man who was rooted in orthodoxy and trained in the indian music tradition how did he um, even Think, how did this idea even occur to him? How did he do something like this? So that is what is explored in the documentary. So we got footage from um, Madras, Kashi, um, uh, Tanjavur and a few other places and it's still being made. And so that is uh, the documentary. That's awesome. So uh, Dr. Kanix, we are coming very close to uh, the end of our show, but we will make sure that uh, all the important questions that we have for you, we go through that. So even if we go a little bit over, that is perfectly fine. So my uh, next question for you is your daughter is a trained professional musician. Yeah. How did that happen? Especially staying oh. here in the US. So she had an aptitude for music and um, while growing up and uh, while she was a kid, like when she was four or five years old, we used to play pieces to her and sing. Uh, th taught her to s identify ragas. So she could listen to any piece of music and say what rag it was based on. Mm -hmm. Of course, within the scope of what she knew. So at the age of five, she probably knew like more than maybe a hundred ragas or something. Oh, like wow. That. Yeah, she could just listen to something and say, oh, this is uh, um, Hamsa Dhvani. Or, wow! Yeah. Or this. So is, she already uh, had that year for music. We were even without getting trained. Yeah. And pattern recognitions and things like that. So she, she didn't sing at that time, but she could identify, listen to anything, and relate to it. And identify. Right. Nice. And and uh, so the exercises that we used f with her to get to this were, were all informal, but I kind of systematized them and actually teach it to kids um, okay. during summer workshops and probably even to adults if they're interested as to how to listen to her music and identify what raga it is in and all that. Um, yeah. And then she started learning from me and then the first set of compositions she learned were, by the age of seven, she learned music theory and uh, how to identify the, the 72 so-called the, the Mela scales in uh, Southern Indian music and the mm -hmm. logic behind them and all kind of stuff. And then she started singing these compositions. She learned all the 39. So in, when she was like 11 years old, we decided, okay, why don't we record them? And that's how this album came into being. The mm -hmm. song that you just heard now, it's called Vismaya, meaning wonderment. Um, so that was her first recording, recorded album of 39 compositions. So that was her voice. That was your yeah, daughter's was, voice. Oh, yeah. wow. Awesome. Yeah. That yeah. was amazing. Um, and then we released it in India and other places. Um, 
And then she decided to major in music. So she got a degree in voice performance at CCM along with uh, a double major in voice performance and also music history. And then mm-hmm. she went to uh, McGill University in Canada to get a mas- master's in uh, early music, which is the music of uh, 15th, 16th century Europe. And so she sings in many ensembles and but, around. And she's learned Indian. Um, uh, uh, she, she gave her... Indian music recital, her first uh, uh, Rang Pravesh recital so many years ago. Okay. She has a big repertoire of Indian kritis and ragas and so on. And she's sung in my albums and we, um, her own full-fledged album, we brought it out just a couple of years ago. It's called Sharda. Sharda. Um, it's based on compositions dedicated to Sharda or Saraswati. And uh, why don't I just share a composition? Yeah, yeah, let's 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 do that. Yeah, that will be amusing. Let's do that. Yeah. Or I could play a short. Okay, let me just play this. Um, the problem is when you are playing from your end, uh, it's not uh, the 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 music is not coming through. I don't know why. Correct. Yeah. So I'll just send it to you. Yeah, that'll be better. With one of the country's biggest supply chains, oh, it's actually playing over there. Fresh for everyone. Yeah. So did you send it to me? I just did. Yes, you did. Okay. All right. Let me click on that. Okay. And now let me share screen. There. Okay. I just sent you one more link, which is from a concert we had last year. Uh, oh, okay. Very, sh- very short piece. Okay. Let me, let me click on that. Hold on. Okay. Let me share the screen. Yeah, that was super amazing. That was truly mesmerizing. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so what is she pursuing now? I mean, like, well, now she's done with her degree and everything. So, how is she moving on with her career in music? 
So in the field of music, there's no end to what you can pursue. So there's That's always true. doctoral options and uh, multiple fields that you can specialize in. Specialize in, and uh, she is working on those. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ganix. So one last question for you: uh, What is uh, in store in future for you, as far as your uh, music journey is concerned? Um, I'm working on an uh, on the music score for an audio book. Oh wow! Um, it just um, it's 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 been in progress for a couple of years now. I'm done with the scoring, and they're just doing the post production work. So it's a unique concept. It's um, a story being told with characters and with uh, background music and a lot of songs. And uh, the theme is a combination of a contemporary plus ideas from the Ramayana and all that kind of stuff. So it's very interesting, and it should be hopefully out. In How long the- is that? The score itself is like forty-five minutes long. And, oh, wow! Uh, the actual, the entire play is probably at least three hours, I would think. Wow! Oh, there are a lot of songs in it, and we got it recorded in India. Oh, okay. And when is that coming out? I hope it is soon, and maybe <laughs> I hope it's before the end of the year. So. Okay. Okay. Well. Uh, well. Good luck to you on that. Our best wishes to you on that. Uh, now, how does the music world look for you as far as choir is concerned? Your passion is concerned post COVID. Um, it's a it's a great question. Um, COVID has caught all of us unawares. I mean, life is completely what anything that we took for granted cannot be taken for granted anymore. Correct. Mm-hmm. So education is changing. The world of performance is totally, totally changing. For instance, if you go look at the Aronoff Center, which seats 25, 2,600 people, if they seat people only in every other seat and every other row, the capacity is going to be reduced very quickly to 650. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you cannot have 150 people on stage performing the kind of work that we need for. I think for the immediate future, see when all of when it can when it is declared safe that everybody's immune, then the story is different. But when is when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? We don't know. Nobody knows. That's but true. But we've all very quickly latched on to the um, online mode of teaching, learning, performing. We really cannot um, perform collectively online. Bless you. Sorry, thanks. Um, but then, because of latency issues, um, mm-hmm. but then I, I'm sure technology, the, the, the Silicon Valley is kind of scrambling to get over that issue also. Already you're seeing very quick enhancements in Teams and mm-hmm. other things at the workplace, right? So, right. so right. things are getting better by the day. So it's only a matter of time before the latency problem is solved, I hope. And if that is the case, people will be able to, at least small groups will be able to collaborate online. So just imagine, uh, um, even in the, uh, if, it's, if you're looking at a three-member ensemble, if you, you, if you imagine a singer from uh, uh, Mumbai and a tabla player from San Francisco, uh-huh. and a harmonium player from Australia, um, <laughs> getting together and overcoming the latency issues and singing together, that'll be fantastic. That will be amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the world will become so small. I mean, It'll yeah. become small and then there's wood. Once you get used to it and just accept, hey, this is what I have. This is the only way I can listen to concerts. Right. So we're all going to get big screens and watch what we want. And that day may not be a non-reality. It may actually happen. And then if it can happen for three people, it can happen for three groups of 20 people, let's say. That is true. That is true. Yeah, that, that's very right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, before we end our show, anything that you think I might have missed and you would like to talk about? Uh, you covered quite a lot, Ashish. Thank you very much. And also, uh, I will keep you updated on any online activities that, that we come up with. Okay. Um, and uh, if we have any workshops on musicology or music appreciation or something, I'll let you know. And uh, um, I'd love to get the word across to l- listeners. And we can all learn together. We can all uh, become better musicians together. That is so, true. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanix. So uh, one thing I wanted to let all our uh, listeners know that Dr. Kanix is also on the uh, panel of Bharat FM as a chief mentor. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanix, for being on that and helping us guide in the right direction. Uh, thank you very much. 
Yeah. And with that, uh, Dr. Kanix, we would like to end this show. Thank you very much for the sharing your journey and uh, helping us understand music better than what we already knew. And with that, we would like to uh, say thank you to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, listeners on Bharat FM, uh, thanks for your time. I we hope that you enjoyed this program, Rubaru, uh, where we got to know a little bit more about Dr. Kanix. And uh, the next Saturday, we will have another personality who is from uh, Mumbai. She is a doctor, Purvi Chawla, and she is a diabetologist. So she is going to talk a lot about diabetes in general how you what you can do to uh, be healthy and how you can make your life better your health better so please tune in uh, next saturday at noon est uh, thank you very much uh, and until then we will uh, say goodbye to everybody and have a wonderful day out here in cincinnati and good night to folks in india and in the rest of the world whatever time it is thank you very much This is Bharat FM. Baje ka Bharat, jhume ka Bharat. Baje ka Bharat, jhume ka Bharat. This is Bharat FM.